The second objection that Marquis presents and defends flow against goes something like this. Look, fetuses aren't sentient. Hence, they lack moral standing. Hence, their flow, their potential for a future like ours isn't relevant to determining whether or not they have rights. Because they have no sentience, they have no moral standing. They are on par, this line of argumentation would go, with rocks or furniture. They are things that just aren't sentient, and hence they have no moral standing, and their potential to become sentient isn't something that imbues them with moral standing, given that they have no moral standing now. Now, Marquise's response to this is to say, look, we should understand the lack of sentience in fetuses in the same way that we understand temporary unconsciousness in regular adult human beings. So remember those cases where you go to the hospital and you go under general anesthesia or you take a sleeping pill or you go to sleep, right, where you're no longer currently sentient. Marquis says, well, we don't deny that people have moral standing whenever they slip into unconsciousness because they're no longer sentient. We suppose that they have moral standing because their lack of sentience is temporary. It's only if we have reasons to suppose that their lack of sentience is permanent that it affects their moral standing. And so he says fetuses should be thought of in the same way. Sure, they currently lack sentience, but their lack of sentience is something that uh, will no longer be the case if they're allowed to develop and come to term and become babies and adults. And so we should think of their lack of sentience as temporary. And uh, this does seem to be a reasonable response here. Someone who wants to push this objection might argue that there is still a difference between adults who become unconscious and fetuses, namely that adults already have moral standing. Their lack of sentience is a temporary break for, of sentience for a creature that already has moral standing. And so they differ from fetuses, which have never been sentient. And so fetuses, one might argue, are more like rocks and tables and uh, inanimate objects than they are like adults because they've never qualified to have moral standing. There is no sense in which we are somehow uh, violating their past moral standing or obligations that are generated from history when we say that they have no current moral standing because they're not sentient in the way that it seems to be true for adults who are temporarily unconscious. So we might consider this kind of response of whether or not Marquis uh, has an adequate defense of this criticism. Now, the third objection that Marquis considers is an objection that the flow position has implications that run contrary to our ethical intuitions or our common sense judgments about uh, rights. And so recall that um, in arguing that murder was understood and explained to be a more heinous moral offense than, say, lying or stealing because the amount of harm and the quality of harm that's inflicted on an individual by ending their life is much greater than the harm inflicted by an individual isolated lie or an individual isolated case of theft. And so this seems to make intrinsic or essential to the flow position that flow is a quantity of harm, that part of the seriousness that should be accorded to flow has to do with how much harm ending someone 
life will inflict upon them. And so that seems to invite the idea that there are different harms inflicted to people based on the amount of quantity of flow that they're being deprived of, or for that matter, based on the quality of the flow that they're being deprived of. So on this idea, right, if you kill a seven-year-old, that seven-year-old has a future life like ours that extends out 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. They have a lot of flow. And by ending their life, you inflict the harm of depriving them of all that flow. Whereas someone who is 97 has a hour, a day, a year, two years left of flow, and hence has much less flow. And so on this line of argumentation, it looks like the idea that flow is what grants you a right to life, uh, that idea, that line of argumentation seems to commit you to an idea that that right is differential that some people have greater harm inflicted on them by being killed and hence have a superior right to life than other individuals. And so young people uh, have a more significant right to life. They are harmed in a morally much more heinous fashion than old people who seem to have a less significant right to life and that seem to be harmed less by killing them. And that doesn't accord with our intuitions about what it is to have a right to life. People normally think of a right to life as something that is had or not had, not had in degrees. People don't compare rights to life uh, in their normal everyday thinking, in their common sense judgments. People either have a right to life or they don't have a right to life. They don't have more of a right to life than someone else, at least on first blush. And this consequence of the flow of view seems to uh, run contrary to that intuition that people seem to have, that pre-theoretic ethical judgment that they make. And it's not simply quantity, it's also quality. So someone who's uh, perpetually dysphoric and depressed is going to have a lower quality of flow than someone who is perpetually satisfied with their life and fulfilled. But that doesn't seem to mean that they have, uh, the people who are fulfilled have a greater right to life or suffer more egregious moral harm when they're killed than the people who are dysphoric. That isn't something that at least is obvious, even though it seems to be a pretty clear implication of the view. Now, Marquise has two sorts of responses to this. One response says, well, look, flow only establishes or provides a sufficient reason for someone having a right to life. It doesn't guarantee that their rights to life are equal or the harms done to them by ending their lives are going to be equal to each other. But appeals to other factors are what bring about the equality of right to life. And so he points to, for instance, Fred Feldman's suggestion that the accomplishments of an individual are part of what determines the value of their life and hence the harm that's done by killing them. Now, even if we buy into that, right, that doesn't provide us with a clear way of resolving all the difficulties that have been uh, pointed to by this objection. It suggests that maybe somehow we can come up with a story that gets all the cases right, but that's not actually a theoretical answer. When someone proposes a theory about something, the onus is on them to show that their theory adequately explains and predicts the phenomenon that it's intended to explain and predict. That if it's being used to justify rights, uh, it has to justify rights in the way that seems correct and reasonable. And insofar as it fails to do that, then the onus is on the person who forged the theory to make it clear how it is that they resolve all of these concerns. And it seems to me that this hand-waving to extra flow features doesn't really uh, 
give us a satisfactory response here. Now, the other way that Marquis responds to this third objection is by uh, suggesting that while flow uh, does seem to potentially allow for differential quantities and qualities of harm being done to people and seemingly different degrees of a right to life, that the actual accounting, the actual attempt to quantify differences in quality or quantity of flow is so difficult or onerous or next to impossible that uh, flow uh, sanctions a convention to treat all of them equally for the purposes of practicality. Now, two aspects of this objection seem inadequate, or this response of the objection seem inadequate. On the one hand, it doesn't seem like there are these incredibly subtle nuances of calculation that are difficult, if not impossible, to perform in practice. The difference between a newborn infant's flow and a 97-year-old terminal cancer patient's flow in terms of quantity seem pretty clear-cut and not difficult to quantify. And so if they actually matter, if they actually determine whether or not the 97-year-old terminal cancer patient has a right to life on par with the newborn infant, then that seems like a calculation that's not at all difficult or abstruse. Uh, and so this objection that they're too hard to calculate seems unreasonable. And similarly, right, uh, people who are suffering from clinical depression, who are chronically dysphoric, they seem to have a quality of flow that is easily differentiable from people who uh, consistently score high in self-assessments of life satisfaction, who feel fulfilled with their life all the time, who never experience doubt or worry or uh, dysphoria in any way, shape, or form. Those don't seem to be subtle judgment calls that are impossible for us to come to any or reasonable estimate of. Those seem to be pretty clear-cut cases that are easy to differentiate. And if they have this consequence of resulting in uh, happy people being uh, granted a greater right to life than unhappy people, that doesn't seem to be obviously consistent with our intuitions about rights or our pre-theoretic judgments about what having a right entails. In addition to that, the nature of this response doesn't really seem to address the concern as it's raised. So the concern isn't, does flow allow for our intuitions that we have a convention to treat everyone's rights as being equal in extent and degree? That isn't the intuition we have, and we don't have that judgment. So people don't say, you know, I have this intuition that we should adopt conventions that say that everyone who has a right to life has a equal right, that there isn't more of a right for one person as opposed to another. And we don't have uh, common sense judgments that say the important thing here is that we adopt this convention of equality amongst rights. So that's not the intuition or the judgment that people have that we should adopt a convention. The intuition or judgment is that there really is no difference, that rights are equal. If a person has a right to life, then they have a right to life to the same degree and extent that anyone else who has a right to life has a right to life. And so we can't explain why it is that we should conventionally treat it that way and be satisfied with that response. We have to understand why it is that flow, uh, in fact, shows them to be equal. And this, I think, his response doesn't do.